Um, welcome, everyone. As Andrew mentioned, I'm Marlene Jen Jennings, the president of QCGN, and I'm joined uh, by Jonathan Goldblum, who um, is with Avenue Communications, our consultant, doing a heck of a lot of work with QCGN to allow us to get our analysis of Bill 96 out into the community, into different sectors, key people, opinion leaders, you name it. So I welcome uh, Jonathan as well. As you know, we want to share with you our analysis, our policy analysis of Bill 96 and how it impacts different sectors. So we've um, already, how, through um, the auspices of a member of the Bar of Quebec, who's a close support, real supporter. Um, he organized a webinar for uh, English speaking lawyers on Bill 96, which had the much more judicial take on it. Um, we've met with uh, uh, private sector business uh, representatives like the Chambre de Commerce de Montréal Metropolitaine. We'll be meeting with the Conseil du Patronat and we'll be honing in on what, it, what the impact is will be on business. This one is for our community, our, our culture, um, cultural uh, community organizations, individuals, enterprises that work in that field and what the um, overall um, view we have of, Q, of uh, Bill 96s, but then we'll hone into more about what's the impact directly for your organizations, your associations. Jonathan, did you wanna add anything to that? No, I, that's perfect introduction. Okay, so the first thing, as you see on the first page of the presentation, it's an alarming attack on the rights of Quebecers. Why you ask? Well, right now, our legal system and our democratic society here in Quebec is based on a pyramid system where the court, the charter of uh, Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms and the Quebec Charter of Human Rights and Freedoms are at the top of the pyramid. You then have the judiciary. You then have all of the other laws. Bill 96 will upend that by the using the notwithstanding clause and by specifying in the preamble that the, uh, the parliament, the sovereign parliament of Quebec, which is the National Assembly, will be the sole and ultimate arbiter of the interpretation of Bill 96 as it pertains to any rights and freedoms and any other aspect of activity within Quebec. That means now that instead of our Charter of Rights and Freedoms being at the top of the pyramid in our society, Bill 101 as amended by Bill 96 will be at the top of the pyramid. And everything and anything that could require any kind of interpretation because there's a claim that it infringes on fundamental human rights and freedoms has, has and will be interpreted through Bill 96, Bill 101 amended, and the final arbiter will be the National Assembly. They also, with the use of the notwithstanding clause, they also suspend both charters. So the rights and freedoms of all Quebecers are suspended and have no application and cannot be contested before the courts if any if the allegation is that Bill, uh, Bill 101 as amended by Bill 96, that is the charter of the French language, um, is at the root of that infringement. So they can infringe all of our rights and freedoms on the uh, basis that it's in the charter of the French language and therefore it's not an infringement because you have no rights and freedoms when it comes to the charter of the uh, French language. Can you go to the next page, please? Uh, 
<laughs> so as you can see, what it really is, is not an act respecting French Quebecers. Um, it's an, actually an act disrespecting Quebecers and using the official language and common language of Quebec as a tool to control how we live. And you have to understand the issue of the common language. Right now, Bill, uh, the Charter of the French Language, or commonly known as Bill 101, regulates the workplace, regulates signage. It does not regulate the language that people use when they're on the bus, when they're in the as a metro, when they're shopping in a, mag in a store or uh, dealing with a company, but they're dealing um, on a private basis. It's not a business transaction. So two people are sitting on the bus and they're speaking to each other in Hebrew, in Portuguese, in Spanish, in Polish, Hungarian, um, you name it, uh, English, that's a common language that they have. Under the new charter of the French language, that could be a violation of the French charter. Imagine. Next page, please. So our areas are, of concern are the constitution, human rights, business, justice, education, and health. And let me go into a little bit uh, of each section. Ne next page, please. So Bill 96 uh, would establish a unilateral amendment to the Constitution Act of 1867 to recognize that Quebecers form a nation. Doesn't explain who are defined, who are Quebecers. It would also say that French shall be the only official language of Quebec. We already have a charter of the French language that says French is the official language of Quebec. And thirdly, that Fran French is the common language of the Quebec nation. No definition of what or who comprises is a member of the Quebec nation. And two, the common language it's not saying it's the official language. The common language means in relations between private individuals, they use what language is common to them. And this now says that French is the common language. And this is where, when I talked about how it puts the charter of the French language at the top of the pyramid, and um, this claims that we're not talking just about the official language in the workplace, in the uh, um, uh, business place, et cetera. We're in government uh, agencies, you name it. We're talking about between private individuals as well. Real danger. Next piece. So let me add, can I just add some Please. stuff? Right? So there's a couple of things I think that we need to underline. Is that what this leaves you with the impression is that non-Francophones may not necessarily be part of the Quebec that's envisioned by this law. And if you look at what the PAC has done in terms of Bill 21, in terms of immigration policy, it certainly is not an inclusive vision of Quebec. And you know, most of the federal parties and all political parties have said that this really doesn't matter and that um, we shouldn't be concerned about this. The only person who says we should be concerned is the Quebec Justice Minister, Simon Jean-Alain Barret, who has said on numerous occasions that this proposal uh, will have a constitutional implication. So it's not something that the QCGN is going full force against because there's more significant elements of the bill that are, that are troubling to us. But this one should not be understated um, and just put under their carpet as, a, as having no impact on anything. You don't do constitutional amendments without thinking that they're gonna have some sort of influence. And if I can just add on to that, there's a, there's a real uh, discussion and debate among, amongst constitutional experts as to whether or not this unilateral amendment to a constitutional amendment, if it went through, could very well have an impact 
on how our courts interpret all other sections of our constitution. Um, and there's a real debate going on because there's no agreement. A lot of the uh, constitutional scholars and experts say it will have a major impact and therefore it needs to be amended through another amending formula, which would require the, the uh, approval of parliament, uh, Canadian parliament. And then there are those who are the ultra nationalists who say, no, 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 no. Um, this ha would have absolutely no impact on the rest of the constitution, including the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. It's purely symbolic. I went to law school and the one thing that we learned fundamental is that nothing in the constitution is symbolic, but let's go on to the next uh, slide, please. So by use, the use of the notwithstanding clause, suspending the application of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedom and the Quebec Charter of Human Rights and Freedoms, Quebec is effectively creating a charter-free zone. And that means if we believe anyone, and that's any Quebecer, not just English speaking, believe, and it's also companies, um, believe that some, uh, some right that falls under one or both of those two charters is being infringed upon by the application of this new charter of the French language, they have no recourse. We have no recourse because the, the judicial system can't get involved. And we saw that with Bill 21 when it was challenged and it went before the Quebec Superior Court. And the judge basically said, by use of the notwithstanding clause in the hijab bill, Bill 21, my hands are tied. I can tell you. It's definitely an abuse and a violation of fundamental human rights guaranteed under both the Canadian and the Quebec Charter, but I can't do anything because of the notwithstanding clause. Notwithstanding those human rights guaranteed in the Charter, this bill amending the Charter of the French language has preeminence and dominance and the Charter's rights are suspended. So if you put that in a concrete example, if you apply for a job and you believe you don't get the job because you're English speaking, and you believe you've been discriminated against because you're English speaking, you have no recourse in the courts to, um, to appeal that decision. Um, it's also important to remember that this is, this is the second time that this government is using the notwithstanding clause preemptively. In the past, generally, it's been a bill's been passed, and then there's been a court decision, and then the government has decided to use the notwithstanding clause for a period of five years. That's what's happened with the science. Here, they're doing it holus bogus without any court decision. So they're avoiding getting any court intervention, which is what's happened on Bill 21 and is happening here again. Yeah. Thank you, Jonathan. Next slide, please. So where does this fit Bill 96 on the business front? We've heard from business leaders, both in the media, but also in our meetings, saying that there's no need for these amendments. Bill 101 um, largely works well. And when it doesn't, it's not because it, it's not properly uh, written up it's because it's not being applied or not applied properly. So basically business is saying, do not do this. This is going to um, weigh heavily on our landscape and it's going to create a lot of difficulties that will constitute barriers to economic uh, development and growth, to the, um, the attraction of foreign skilled workers to come into Quebec, to attracting foreign investment, um, the, the um, new red tape that's going to be required by Bill 96 <coughs> for businesses 
most of the business most of the business organizations are saying it's it's un, it's unheard of it's not warranted and it will actually be an impediment on growth of small and medium sized com companies and in terms of some of the larger companies it could have a very well an impact on seeking and attracting foreign investment jonathan did you want to add anything well, there's the issue of recruitment, um, for example. Currently, if, if I'm McGill or I'm Power Corporation or an AI company, and I want someone to come from the United States, um, you can, and they have children, you can get a three-year permit to study in an English school for your kids, and generally that can be renewed so it's six years. So it makes a short-term stay for, for someone from outside the province um, livable, and uh, helps our economy boost our economy. Under this bill, they're saying that you can't get that renewed. So you're limited to a three-year window of bringing someone in. So that's gonna hurt, um, it's gonna hurt the economy, it's gonna hurt our ability to recruit. Um, it, there's also issues about labor relations uh, that all reasonable means to, um, in, to avoid imposing a requirement of a knowledge of a language other than French in hiring and promoting. So again, um, it's restricting uh, employment opportunities uh, for non-Francophones. Um, it's putting, uh, for a business perspective, even if you're Trois-Rivières in Trois-Rivières and selling stuff over the internet, you need people of capacity in English. You're gonna have to demonstrate that that's really necessary. So it's just making it a much less welcoming environment for people to come and work in Quebec. And if I can add to that, the issue of uh, how it's, it can make, have a negative impact on business. When I talk about business, I'm not just talking about companies that are for profit. You have businesses that are not for profit. You have businesses working, uh, organizations, uh, not for profit, working in the economic development side, in health and social services, you name it. They actually make profit, but it's invested back in. No one individual makes that profit. It's the, either the membership or the clients um, who, would, who are advantaged by this. So imagine you're a, a theater group um, and you put on plays and um, you recruit uh, artists from outside of Quebec. And um, some of your plays may be in French, but some of them are in English, for example, or in the case of another community, they're in Portuguese. Right now, you're able, especially if you have fewer than uh, 50 uh, employees, you're able to recruit, like Jonathan said, actually negotiate a contract in English and the actual contract can be written up in English. Under Bill 96, it, now if you have 25 or more employees, the Charter of the French Language as amended by 96 applies. And the thing that it says is, not only um, because right now for uh, contracts can be drawn up in French unless the parties expressly agree otherwise, Bill 96 now re adds a requirement that both parties can only agree to a, a contract drawn up in another language like English only after examining the French version. So that means this theater group would have to have already a French version of a contract, hopefully with an English translation next to it, and then the parties negotiate and they can only agree that the actual contract, signing contract, will be in a language other than French after they've negotiated with French documents. That's not the way it works in the business world. That's not the way it works in the contractual world. If a company in La Beauce is doing business with a multinational, the negotiating documents are going to be in English. 
And chances are the contract will probably be in English as well, because those multinationals do business across the world. So they use one language, a business language, which is English, and they have their contracts pre-drafted. Amendments are made to them, uh, modifications, but they're pre-drafted in English. Well, that will no longer be possible. And as I said, it's not just for a for-profit business. It would also be for not-for-profit organizations. Next page, please. So now we get to the increased government surveil surveillance. Right now, under the Charter of the French Language, l'Office de la Langue Française and its inspectors have a right to enter a business to, and, um, to search and to seize. But in order to search and seize, they have to have gone before a judge and gotten a judge warrant, a legal warrant, allowing them to search and seize. And in order to get that warrant, they have to pr provide that they have proved that they have reasonable grounds to suspect that a violation of the charter has happened and that it is of a nature that they have to go and search and they have to seize potential evidence. Under Bill 96, those inspectors will be able to enter any business, any employer's premises, if they have 25 or more employees, without a warrant and seize any electronic equipment, any files, and gain access to electronic equipment from like a mobile phone, like an iPad, like a laptop of anyone who is on the premises when the inspectors show up. And they do not need a warrant for it, and they can conduct the search and the seizure without a warrant. And guess what? They don't have to have reasonable grounds that a violation has taken place. The only thing that they need is an anonymous denunciation from someone who's anonymous and who claims that there was a violation or there might be a violation in the future. Imagine you have a disgruntled, you're that theater group again, you got, you've got 25 employees and someone came, bought tickets to see the show you put on, the play you put on, and they leave and they're disgruntled. They're not happy. They don't think they got their money's worth. So they make an anonymous uh, denunciation to La Fis. And the inspectors can show up and they can seize all of your equipment, all of your documents, your files, everything. And if you happen to have a few clients on the premises, actors um, who are rehearsing, whatever, they can seize theirs. And if the person, if it's password connect, uh, protected and the person refuses to give up their password, there are all kinds of penalties involved. And those penalties, the dollar amounts have been increased significantly. And now every day that you refuse to give up your passcode, the fine, it's like a, a new infraction. So it's the same fine again. So if the fine is $1,000, the first day it's $1,000, second day is 1000 a thousand, third, so, far, so on and so forth. Jonathan, did you wanna add anything to that? Um, I think it's also important to know that on the basis of a recommendation from the Office de la Langue Française, the minister can suspend your business partner and um, that uh, he also can decide that the government won't do business with you. So there's real repercussions to the power of the office who also can come to your francisization committee, insist that it be set up and then come to all of your meetings without being announced. So it's a real intervention into the day-to-day -day operations. And just think of an employee of a competitor who's pissed off or thinks you're too strong. He can file an anonymous complaint just to put um, uh, hurdles in your way. So it's 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 really contrary to democratic principles. Thank you, Jonathan. Next page, please. Next slide. 
creating uh, barriers to accessing justice. Right now in our justice system, any document that's uh, provided, filed by either or both parties can be in either French or in English. Clearly, if it's in a third language, there has to be a certified translation to go along with it. And that certified translation can be in French or in English. Under Bill 96, every single document that is filed within the justice system will have to be in French or will have to be a certified translation of the original document, which is in another language. So you have a divorce, you're separating, you're going before a judge. Right now, um, two people, if they're both their common language is a language other than French, it's English, let's say, all of their documents are going to be filed in English and they'll have a right to have a judge who understands English and therefore can um, do the hearing in English and hear all of the parties. Under Bill 96, Jeanne Barret, the Minister of Justice, has removed knowledge of a second of, of English as, as any kind of precondition for uh, to be named a judge, one. Two, all of the documents will have to be in French. That means that you will have to get them translated by a certified translator. There are already delays today in the system where we can you know, file English or French to get certified translation, translations because there's a, a shortage of translators. Now, with Bill 96, everything will have to be in French, which means that the delays in terms of gaining access and having an actual hearing, whether it's a commercial dispute, whether it's um, a dispute on um, another a matter, family, whatever, the delays will be enormous. And as I said, you no longer will have a guarantee that there'll be sufficient number of judges who can actually understand and speak English to hear the cases. So the delays will extend and become intolerable. Guess what that's going to do? It's going to have a freeze effect. A lot of people who might have, and companies who might have very, very good uh, cases um, to be brought before uh, a court will simply decline doing it. Jonathan? Uh, and again, you come back to the international business stuff. If you're a company in the United States wanting to buy a business in Quebec, all your documents will then have to be in French, which is again, not encouraging uh, the business community to come and invest here. Um, but the divorce example is a good example. If I sold my house to my brother, the documents would have to be in French. And it's just, um, you know, it's contrary to the access to justice provisions that are part of being Canadian. Yeah, thank you. Next uh, slide, please. Limiting your education uh, options. Well, it's largely the education op options for uh, Francophone Quebecers. Um, the government with Bill 96 um, addresses the total number of students, CSHEPs will, uh, English CSHEPs will be allowed to uh, admit and um, they put a cap on it. And as a result, and they say that um, English speaking students who were educated in English, so they had the uh, certificate of eligibility have to be um, uh, favored given priority to the places in the English CGEPs. Most of the CGEPs, English CGEPs are saying, as of now, it's not necessarily an issue, but as time goes on, it will become an issue. And there are some of our English CGEPs in the regions who a majority of their students are Francophones. And if those spots, those francophones can't get into CSHEP based on merit, 
um, English sea chefs based on merits. Some of those sea chefs will have a difficult time filling the spots. Jonathan, did you want to add anything? I just want, I'm going to, I'm not necessarily on education, so we've covered already the three year permit. But I right. think there's an interesting discussion about who is an anglophone. And that there is that. And I think that that's a tangent, but it's a good point to bring it, place to bring it up. Yeah. Because, go ahead. Well, right now, anyone who is English speaking, anyone for whom communication um, in English is easier for them than not, um, is able to simply on the basis of self-identification, on the basis of a request, get their services, get their uh, documents in English. Under Bill 96, they're limiting to only those who have a certificate of eligibility to study in English in the elementary and high school level. Well, that cuts out we're over a million Quebecers for, who are English speaking, but the number who have those certificates of eligibility, <laughs> maybe 300,000 at best. Jonathan, you might have more updated numbers. I don't know numbers. the number, but it certainly shrinks your, your, the size of the community, which then sinks our weight in terms of the capacity to get government services. Yeah. So let's go to the next slide. Oh, the barriers to access, accessing healthcare. Well, right now under the Health Act, since 1986, I believe it is, we have a right to access services, health and social services in English, one on request, but the actual right is based on what's called access plans. And each region, will have an access plan. They've now under one, the, uh, the access plan um, regulations, which they're trying to change, but also under Bill 96, they're reducing that to, well, first of all, only people who have the certificate of eligibility would be in a position to request their health and social services in English, one. Two, the government is going to decide who sits on the uh, regional access committees, who are the ones who evaluate, because each institution, um, each CIS and CIUS, and each of the, in, the uh, individual, like uh, in l'Institut de Cardiologie, l'Institut uh, Pinel de Psychiatrie, they have to produce an access plan, even if they're not designated bilingual. They have to uh, say, we can provide services in English in these areas. And when, if the population is sufficiently large, then probably a lot of their services are provided in English. And if they're unable to, they're supposed to make agreements with those institutions that have the services in English and ensure that there's a real um, uh, accessible corridor to get from one to the other. Under Bill 96, First of all, the employers are going to have to, like Jonathan said, it'll be the same thing as in the private sector, have to justify any position that they designate as requiring English. And there are a whole series of provisions that actually discourage an employer who would want to do that from doing it. Jonathan, did you want to add The only other thing I'd like to add to that is... Um, currently, my understanding in the system is that to, to, for a physician to practice in Quebec, that you have to pass a French language test, and that that's part of the social contract. You've got to be able to provide services in English and French. But under so, but you pass that test once. It's like getting a driver's permit. You don't have to go and get it renewed, and to take the driver's test after you've passed it once. Under this bill, if I don't believe that my physician is speaking adequate French. I can file a complaint and that complaint can lead to an investigation of the doctor or the physician 
uh, just to buy the official langue française or buy the eau de profession, which then could lead to my not being able to practice in, in Quebec. Um, so it's quite a dramatic thing. Um, and again, it's like the official langue française and the infractions and looking into the francisization of a business. I may be upset with my doctor for a bunch of reasons that I don't think that I'm getting advanced on the surgery list or I'm, you know, just don't like them. Um, but this gives a whole anonymous power to uh, allow someone to spark an investigation of a physician, which again is not, in, you know, when we're having trouble attracting healthcare professionals across the board in Quebec, it's a real, it's a real issue. Thank you. Let's go to the next slide. We're going to have to speed this up. So how can you help stop Bill 101? Well, contact your elected official. And that's regardless of which party that m and um, represents. For instance, regardless of which party the member of parliament uh, represents, because even if Bill 96 is provincial legislation, all of the federal parties, with the exception of the uh, Green Party, have all said, we don't have a problem with it. We support Quebec going ahead and doing what they want to do with Bill 96. We don't have a problem with the notwithstanding clause, uh, suspending both charters of rights and freedoms, creating a charter-free zone. We don't have a problem with the unilateral constitutional amendment. We don't have a problem with it. That's what every single political party at the federal level has said. So contact, write your elected officials, and um, you can use our platform, which is not too withstanding.com. Uh, Andrew can put it up in the chat so you can copy it. You can share your opinion with us. Um, email us your opinion on Bill 96 and how you see it directly affecting your organization, your sector of activities. Um, and we will um, uh, make sure that it's, it's a, 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 um, how do you say, annexed to um, our brief that we'll be presenting to the National Assembly uh, hearings. We also encourage you to participate. We're holding uh, public hearings on Bill 96. Um, later in September, but before the National Assembly begins its hearings. And so we encourage you to um, give your voice to our community. Uh, listen to the consultations. If you want to appear, let us know that you'd like to appear and um, publicly uh, provide your position on Bill 96. And we ask you if you can follow us on the web, on Twitter. Um, yeah. And I think that's about it. Jonathan, did you want to add anything? Yeah, just before we turn it over to q and A's, I think it's important to put Bill 96 in context. This has been a bill that the government has spent a lot of time uh, developing and writing, and it's a very comprehensive bill. And it's much more than, as we just explained about, than just promoting the French language. Um, it's been difficult for us because first, when it was tabled, we had to figure out what it said. And we had a government, you know, most times when a government tables a piece of legislation, they come out and they do it with much fanfare and they tell you how this is gonna be great for the nation. Uh, in this case, they put out so many trial balloons and about signage, about SAGEPs, um, about municipalities, and then they stepped back from that and didn't promote what uh, the other elements of the bill. There's been no discussion about the increased role of the Office de la Langue Française. No discussion about the impact on education or on health and social services or access to justice. So we had to take the time to find out what was in it. We're now in the middle of trying to explain it to people and we're going in now into the real debate about it. And we really need your help to speak up, spread the word um, and help us counter what is really a new definition of Quebec. And I, in closing, I will remind people that I'm old enough and Marlene's old enough to remember when the charter, uh, the Quebec charter was passed by Bourassa in 75 and then adopted by René Lévesque and strengthened in the early eighties by René Lévesque and the Parti Québécois. And everyone was so proud of that legislation, all political parties in the National Assembly 
that the charter was sent to every home in Quebec. And it was a source of pride and it was a source of, we could be differ on independence and federalism, but as the values of a society and the values of an inclusive society, we all agree. And this is really a very different vision of what Quebec is. When you suspend the charter and you don't um, uh, um, promote individual rights over collective rights in certain cases. And in closing, in a piece of optimism, all our polling data shows that all Quebecers support the charter. And when they understand that the bill contravenes the charter, their opposition to the bill goes up. That was true in Bill 21, and it's true in this one. They also support access to justice and access to health care, regardless of your language. So there's much more that brings us together as Quebecers. And that's what we really have to exploit as we go forward and promote a debate on this bill. Thanks a lot. So we're now open to the Q's and A's. Uh, so we're looking to you, Andrew, to... All right, we have several questions and not a lot of time left. So I'll try and combine some quickly that are on the same kind of wavelength. Um, I think you kind of talked about this, but I think there's more questions about what does this mean for English speaking organizations mandated or who do serve the English speaking population, especially if they're federally funded versus if they're provincially funded, will they be allowed to serve their constituents in English still? Under Bill 96, Bill 101 is going to apply to any employer who, ha who has 25 or more employees on their staff. So Bill 96 is encroaching on federally regulated entities. Okay. And if I, and I'm not a lawyer, but if I'm not mistaken, the bill does say that it applies to federally regulated businesses. Yes, it does. And therefore it means that Bill 101 will apply to, and guess what? Try to contest it, notwithstanding clause. <laughs> so the, the opportunity to contest it is, is limited, um, uh, severely restricted. So yes, there's a danger that um, uh, Le Fils de la Langue Française, if Bill 96 get, gets adopted and then comes into force, will apply to you that according to the government and according to Le Fils. And that would mean that even if you're mandated to provide services in English to an English speaking clientele, you might be required to show that that English speaking clientele has a certificate of eligibility. So you have a, a Polish Quebecer who speaks, who you know, was born in Poland, um, is you know, a senior, learned how to speak English, for instance, perhaps spoke it even before they came here, is now in their 80s, um, and you're providing a service to them, well, unless it's an organization that can provide it in Polish, you'll be providing that health service in English. If you have 25 or more employees, according to Bill, 10, uh, Bill 96, the language of work is supposed to be French. The do internal documents are supposed to be French. Do you know if contract or freelance workers would count in the 25 uh, person limit? I don't know our analysis. We've done a, a fairly deep dive, but our deep dive hasn't gone that far. However, I would say that given the whole piece about contracts having to be in French, and even when you're at the negotiating stage, those contracts have to be in French before you can come up with a contract that's actually in English, there is, there doesn't appear to be any carve out for self-employed. Okay, so scary stuff. Moving on then, uh, more yeah. to the, again to the provision of services. Um, Blanche asks, as a counselor, I write all my notes in English. I offer all my sessions in English. Would I have to now conduct my sessions in French and write my notes in French. And furthermore, if I was given a court order for a psychiatric evaluation, would that also have to be in French now? It would have to be translated into French before it could be tabled with the court. 
And so that would mean that you or your client would have to find a certified uh, a, a translator recognized by the courts to then um, produce a translation, a French translation of your uh, psychiatric assessment required by the court before it could be uh, tabled with the court. On some of the, I'm looking at some of these questions in the chat, which are very specific. We will take note of them. Where we need to get legal advice, we will ask our lawyer uh, to provide us with an answer and send it, distribute the answer. Uh, exactly. So a lot, there's a lot of questions about um, certificate of eligibility needed. Um, Jonathan and Marlene, do you want to talk on that just a bit more to maybe explain it to people how it might work? Or are we still unclear on what that's going to look like? No, the Bill 96 clearly states that in order to have a right to uh, receive services from, for instance, the provincial government, um, any of its uh, agencies, the parapublic uh, system, um, you have to be able to produce a certificate of eligibility. It says that clearly. Okay. Um, just to switch gears for a second, maybe we'll come back to the eligibility questions mm -hmm. in a second. Um, given all the work we've done over the summer, I see on the not with, no to notwithstanding clause website, we've sent over 3,400 emails. And I know we've sent some to party leaders federally and provincially. Uh, have we received any responses from anybody yet? To my knowledge, and Jonathan might uh, uh, have more up to date, the only response that we have received has been from the um, Green Party, yeah. I believe. And um, basically they commit, they commit that um, if they form the government, um, they would ensure that Bill 96 is studied in the House of Commons and uh, the Senate. Problem with that is, is that they don't understand our parliamentary system. <laughs> you don't. The par Canadian Parliament has no jurisdiction to study a provincial piece of legislation. Um, were they more up to tune on how our constitution actually works? What they would have said is that they would bring the issue of unilateral uh, constitutional amendment to be studied. And then you can look at where it's been done, what were the uh, legal uh, underpinnings to do it, et cetera. I think it's also important to know that QCGN has called for a reference to the Supreme Court. Yes. That that is um, something we would very much like the political parties to endorse. Um, fundamentally, none of the political parties, provincial or federal, have given us a response at this date. We've been in, had conversations with the provincial liberals. We've had conversations with Solidaire. Um, and prior to the tabling of the bill, we had a meeting with the Minister of Justice, but no one has really responded to our specific issues. Uh, okay, now to switch back to more of a scary thought again. Um, how is Quebec a democratic province kind of getting away with this? How are they allowed to have no kind of, are there not going to be any guidelines for uh, the tips required for the OQLF to come in and, and search and seize your business? Or is it just going to be kind of whatever they think is deemed appropriate, they can go in there? Right now, under Bill 96, there's no requirement for um, any reasonable <laughs> motives or grounds. Literally, there there's no requirement. It's on the basis of an anonymous denunciation. And it doesn't even have to be a formal complaint. They've actually created, it's like a whistleblower who will be anonymous, but who will not have to provide any uh, reasonable uh, proof that there's actually been a violation. So a disgruntled client, a disgruntled employee, former employee, a competitor, um, you name it, could file maliciously uh, uh, an anonymous denunciation, the company or organization uh, or employer who's the object of that, that denunciation will have no right to know who filed it 
and um, has no right um, to uh, legal right to contest uh, warrantless search and seizure. Uh, okay, so back to the certificate of eligibility. There's a ton of questions regarding uh, seniors who may have been educated prior to the adoption of Bill 11 originally. How would they go about getting a certificate of eligibility or does it even exist for them? What, what does it mean for seniors? Um, I, can't get, I cannot give you a definitive answer on that, but I'm one of those seniors who was educated in English, both elementary and high school before that whole system came into place. And therefore I never had a certificate of eligibility. Um, but the, I understand the process is you contact the school board. Jonathan, you may know more about this. I think this we, is a really good question and I think we better look into this because I think okay, it, shows so, the, it shows the absurdity of the bill. and. Yeah. Just like they had problems with the passport because seniors don't have, a lot of seniors don't have uh, photo IDs, nor do kids under 16. I think this is a technicality the government hasn't even reflected on. Okay, so we'll get that information and um, we'll put it out on our website. We won't be able to send the answers to all of the individual participants here, but we urge you to check continually our website and when we have the answers, we put them up. Uh, okay, so I think we're running, we're running short on time here. So I'm going to try yeah. and do two Last more little question. questions. That okay, can, two. It's Go just ahead. Gonna, it's gonna, they lead into each other. Uh, one for okay. Jonathan and, and for Marlene as well. Um, I know you've talked about what we're doing up to date, Jonathan, but uh, what kind of last steps are we preparing in the media? If there's going to be a media blitz now to really get this information out. This is super vital information for the community to know. Is there a kind of a last ditch effort to get that info out there? And lastly, what is the expected timeline going forward with Bill 96? I know the hearings start in about three weeks. Uh, after that, is this bill adopted by Christmas or are we looking at about a year long process still? Do we have any indication on that yet? Um, well, I'm not calling this a last ditch effort yet. Um, we, you know, we, so we've divided the communications campaign into several phases. The first phase was understanding the bill and being out there a bit in the media to explain what was in the bill. Uh, and now we're reaching out to groups. Uh, over the next three weeks leading into the hearings, we are gonna start taking positions and start putting issues out there, uh, whether it's elements from the presentation you heard from Marlene. So what are the implications on business? What are the implications on education? We're gonna, uh, through our own public hearings that start next Thursday, uh, and speeches and releases that we're gonna put out, start to begin to highlight some of the issues. We're trying to do this in partnership with others. So we're hoping, for example, that the Conseil de Patronat or the Chambre de Commerce will support us on the aspects about business. We're hoping that the Barreau will help us on uh, the legal elements, which is again, we've written every group that's presenting before the National Assembly and asked to meet with them. So we've met with union leaders, we're meeting with the business leaders, et cetera. Um, our next, so bunch of positions we're gonna take between now and the middle of September, then we'll release our brief, which will be a very legal document because we wanna have every argument in there because we know we're going to court. So this is gonna be our Bible for that, but we'll have a public relations element to that. We're gonna to continue to lobby through the National Assembly hearings. Then we expect if you're asking me for a timeline, I would expect they're gonna to wanna to pass this by the end of the year and have it done before the election. Uh, we're gonna to have to continue to work on through digital media, through opinion leaders, through a whole bunch of things to try and bring attention to the issues where we feel that it's not an English, necessarily an English issue, it's an issue for Quebec. So that's why we're focusing on the charter free zone. We're focusing on the business elements. We're focusing on the access to justice. Um, the access to health care, uh, and hoping that others, not only Anglophones, will come out and support us. And that's the overall strategy. All right. Andrew? So that's, you thank you very much to both of you guys. Um, that was a super informative 56 minutes. Uh, we could sit here and talk about Bill 96 for another hour and a half if we wanted to, but I know we cannot. Uh, for all those asking, 
a recording will be sent of this webinar to everyone who participated today. It will be on our website as well. I'm putting our Bill 96 website into the chat right now. Click there for all information around Bill 96 and to stay updated on anything the QCGN will be doing going forward. Um, Marlene, Jonathan, I'll leave you guys with the closing remarks. Thank you, Andrew. Um, I'd like to thank you all for giving up your precious time to um, attend this uh, webinar on Bill 96. I really appreciate, and QCGN does as well, all of the time that you're um, uh, devoting to this. I particularly want to thank uh, Jonathan, my co-host, because he, he and his company has uh, done enormous around, uh, amount of work in um, helping us develop strategies and um, communication strategies as to how to get the word out. And so a big thank you to Jonathan and to Avenue Communications, to the QCGN staff like Andrew. We, I wouldn't be here able to provide you with what you see if there wasn't all of um, these these professionals in the background doing all of the technical work, uh, the content work, et cetera. So thank you to everyone. And please, any questions you have, if you haven't had a chance to put it in the chat or in the Q&As, uh, Andrew has tracked all of that. Um, we'll get those answers and we will be posting them on our sites and if possible, getting it out to all of you as well. Thank you so much and please do, do whatever you can to make sure that your voices are heard about Bill 96 and all of the dangers it represents. We, would we will be living in, a, in Quebec, which is diametrically opposed to a liberal democracy where fundamental rights and human uh, freedoms are the actual basis and anchor and pillar of our society in all spheres of activity if Bill 96 goes through, is adopted and becomes enforceable. Thank you and have a great day. Bye. Thank you, take care.